For completeness, I'd like to show an example of one-shot color camera data configured in WBPP where we use a bias frame instead of a matched dark frame to calibrate the flats. That's really the only difference. Everything else is going to be the same. But I can make a few comments about the configuration and might add something that I didn't say in the previous video where I set up a one-shot color camera a data set that had matching darks for flats. It's really the only difference. So let's just look at this example. It'll just be another nice example to, uh, to load. Oh, before I go into WBPP, it's a good idea to go ahead and make a cosmetic correction template. I have two now available. They are identical, so I'll just select one of them. It is using the automatic uh, detection of hot pixels with a sigma, hot sigma here of three sigma. That's it. I do want to make a comment. Here's one comment that I don't think I said last time. When you use WBPP, you don't need to check the CFA box here because WBPP, of course, knows when you tell it as a color image, it's going to know what to do when you uh, try to do cosmetic correction. It'll understand, oh, this is color data, so I have to uh, work on it accordingly. Uh, if we were just using this cosmetic correction tool all on, all on its own, this process, and we fed it color data uh, with that had a color filter array, then we do need to check the box for the output. But in this case, we don't need to. So it just there's a little piece of information there. So we're going to go into the script to weighted batch preprocessing, which I want to change the name to uh, weighted batch processing pipeline. I really like that name much better. And uh, I have already navigated to a place on my computer where there is a set of data, uh, one shot color camera data for NGC 300. This data set was kindly provided to me and, um, by Graham, and he uh, made it available so that I could show one shot color camera uh, processing in my fundamentals course. So this data is actually part of one of many data sets, part of the fundamentals course that I have in my, uh, my collection of videos. Uh, and it's just a nice one to use to set up because all the data is right here. So he provided this time biases, flats. We have uh, there are 120 second exposures. So we have dark frames and then the data is located in this directory. Now I can't see the data because I'm just loading the directory button here of WBPP. As far as I remember, it's been a while, I think that all the FITS headers are fine here. So when I do this, it should just load the files correctly. Let me just scroll down here. It looks like that's right. So let's look in each panel. That would I would always do this. I mean, I wouldn't just assume. Let's look in each panel and make sure it makes sense. We have biases, good. We have dark frames, that's good, 120 seconds. We have flat field images. I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. And then we have light frames. They are also 120 seconds and quite a few of them. Let me come back to the flats. One thing that is of some interest here deals with the fact that we can take advantage of a kind of efficiency or a simplification when we're using bias frames to calibrate data. If you look closely here, you can see that these frames are um, of all kinds of different time exposures. Let me just, I'll just press the directory button again because I want to show something to you. If we go into his, no, I can't show it to you that way. Let me do the files button. If we go into his flats directory, we can see that based on the, the naming that he did of his files, he said under his flats that these have something to do with Dawn. And from that, I can infer that he was doing sky flats, not panel, you know, like an electroluminescent panel or t-shirt flats or anything like that. He was actually looking at the, the morning sky. And that's of, that actually makes sense with what we're seeing here. That's of interest because you'll notice all of these times and how different they are. They go from four seconds all the way up to 20 seconds. That's because, of course, during twilight, either side, evening or morning, as the sun is uh, below the horizon, the, the earth is turning, of course, and that sky brightness is constantly changing. It's not a single particular brightness. These cameras are so sensitive that from moment to moment, literally one moment to the next, uh, you can detect how bright the sky is either becoming brighter or darker, depending upon whether it's evening or morning. And so f your exposure times uh, change rather dramatically to get the same light level. That's why we have all these different times. By the way, this also shows how 
difficult it can sometimes be if you're doing sky flats when you have many filters to uh, take the flats through or take the flats for. Here, because it's a one-shot color camera, we just have only to change the exposure time to expose all of these pixels. So here's the cool efficiency. Because we can take advantage of a bias frame, we can calibrate, no matter what the exposure time was, for each of these exposures, we can calibrate them all with a single master bias. And that's really great. That's great to be able to do. And the reason we can kind of take advantage of this is the fact that for this sensor that he was using, even when he took a 20 second exposure, there was virtually no significant dark current. There's no difference between a 20 second dark frame, that is, you expose for 20 seconds, and you just expose for, you know, zero seconds, and you just download the information, that's the bias. The difference between those two frames is so small it doesn't matter. So you can calibrate all of this data with a bias, and so that's what's of some interest here, unlike the other examples that I've shown where you need that matching dark frame to match all of your flats. You wouldn't want to do that in this case. There, look how many there would be. Oh, that would be terrible. Okay, so let's go to the calibration panel and make sure that everything makes sense here. We'll click on a light frame group, and I know that I want to turn on the cosmetic correction. Doesn't matter which one. We need to tell it that these are color filter array type images. I do not recall, I do not believe that the this these data have the pattern encoded in the FITS header. I'll check that out in just a moment. I believe that I need to specify the pattern here. I'm trying to recall from my old video. And uh, we do this for all light groups, but we only have one light group. So that's all done, that's set. I will note that this filter name is a little bit funny. Now it was given that by whatever acquisition software uh, he used to generate this data. That's what was written in the FITS header for the filter name. It can be anything as long as it matches uh, the same thing in the flats, and it does. And we can see that it's matching. Uh, let's be sure it's matching here. No, it's not matching at the moment. Okay, that's a good question. We can see that it's matching. I was gonna look up here, but it's not lit up. Why is it not matching right now? You should pause the video. I got ahead of myself and figure it out. Okay, if you had a second to figure it out. It's not matching at the moment because I turned on the fact that these are color, uh, color filter array images, but I haven't yet done it for the flats. You need to do that for the flats as well. And I'll go ahead and do the, uh, the scaling factors too. But having done that, now they're gonna match. They were two different image types a moment ago. One was color and one wasn't. So they'll only match when you have them both as color, of course. Now we see that we have a matching flat, it's checked here. It is going to use this flat because these two uh, keywords match one another. And uh, we should also see that the dark frame here is lit up. That's going to show this dark frame here is going to be used. And as far as the flat field image itself is concerned, it will be calibrated by the bias, which is exactly what we expect. Although this says auto match, the logic of WPPP today, unlike previously. Previously, it would give you all these warnings. It would say, we don't have a matching one. We're going to use a bias instead. Now it just doesn't say that. It's going to use the bias instead. You can see that because it's lit up up above. We can also see that if we show the, the calibration diagram. It's just now hard-coded as logic uh, in the, in the program. Look at all those <laughs> in the program. Okay. That pretty much takes care of setting up the calibration part of this. We can look now at the post-processing portion. We would come here to the lights panel and decide how we want to configure all of the steps that are going to happen after calibration is concerned. So subframe weighting. I'm still going to choose the one I like, which is the PSF scale SNR. I like it. You can stick with PSF signal weight. If you have not seen my videos about the weighting things in PixInsight, these weighting methods or schemes, please watch those. I will link to those videos in the description and elsewhere. So I'll use this one, which requires, by the way, that I am going to be doing local normalization uh, because it needs the LN files to do the PSF scale SNR. We'll, of course, 
Uh, use image registration. Now, does it matter to me which of these files it should register on? If I were very careful about this, I would, of course, blink through all the frames and make sure that, um, you know, they are all reasonable or something like that. And I don't happen to pick, if I were to pick one, I don't happen to pick some random one that was no good. But what I will do is leave this over here in the automatic mode, which means it will look at all of the frames and pick the one that it thinks is best. For example, let me just spell this out. I happen to use sometimes um, a German equatorial mount, and it might be that I want to choose one of the frames because I want the output to be in a particular orientation so I don't have to flip things or worry about it or something. So then I might choose uh, manual, and then I would just select the file that I want. But in this case, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna put it back to auto and it'll pick whatever frame is best and align all of these images accordingly. There are no parameters that I need to mess with here. This data is technically undersampled, but it's not the kind of data that I need to worry about the drizzle data. The reason that I uncheck it as a, is it something to do is that a lot of people I have found, it, although it doesn't require much overhead to generate this data, even if I didn't use it, but it does make a whole bunch more files. Just literally in a directory, you'll see more files. And I find that can be very confusing to people. So I'm minimizing basically confusion in some sense. By unchecking this, it'll just be fewer frames that you'll see in a directory. Local normalization. Um, I will show in one of the sections how to use the interactive mode, not this section. In this section, we're gonna take advantage of the the automatic method of doing local normalization. We can choose, however, whether we want it to be uh, choosing one of the best frames to be the reference from this set of data, or to integrate a number of the best frames from this data to be a reference frame. I have found, and I think it is generally true, to have the integration of best frames be the method that you'd like to employ. And then it's going to be looking in this list and measuring them based on some method here. And you can choose the method that you'd like uh, in order to choose which frames are going to make the best reference frame for local normalization. My recommendation is to stick with PSF signal weight. It overall is going to have kind of the best behavior because it takes into account, account not only the kind of a star quality measures, but also, of course, the, the signal to noise uh, measurement of the images as well. So by taking that all into account, probably it'll be a good pick for um, how it will pick what the best frames are. And then everything else I, I pretty much don't touch. There's more to understand here about these, you know, the nitty gritty details. I do go over that and explain that in my videos at Adam Block Studios, specifically on the section about normalization and weighting. I, I dive into this a little bit. But here, of course, we just need to set it up. So that's how I would set up this particular example of data. And then image integration, well, a couple of things, a couple of things to note here. One is, of course, I'm really not going to change anything. The rejection algorithm is a thing that you normally worry about. If, uh, if there's problems in the data, you want to be sure that it's choosing the correct algorithm from the list. That's based on the number of files that you have. With this number of files here, we know which one it's going to pick. It's going to pick the Generalized Extreme Studentized Deviate, the GESD. Um, if we had slightly fewer frames, we might be picking the Windsor I Sigma Clipping. Between these two, uh, you're pretty much covered on most bases. Um, and then there is this one, the minimum weight. I'm still, at the moment, this is still early times. This is a new version of the... WBPP for me, it might be that I change my mind later. This is not the original usage of this particular parameter, but I'm gonna use it like this. When it generates weights for images, and they are gonna be based on the PSF scale SNR method that I chose, these are all the same exposure time. If it finds within these frames, any uh, frames that have a weight that is smaller than 0.5, I'm not really interested. I don't want uh, PixInsight to integrate them together, to, to use that in the integration. I have a sneaking suspicion that frames with that poorer weight are very likely going to have some kind of issue with them. 
Uh, remember, 0.5 here means that for normalization purposes, it has to multiply by 2, and basically to make it equal to all the other frames. So, or the best frame anyway. So, it's kind of a rule of thumb I like to use, but uh, this is the kind of thing that comes with experience, and you don't have to do this. Um, I'm just going to choose to do that in the, and do this in this particular case. That should be all I need to do to set things up here. Then uh, we've already here. So we can come to the post calibration where we can look. We have everything lit up like we expect. There's nothing I need to do with the exposure uh, tolerance. We can make a decision, however, about what kind of data we want to output. Now I have a section that specifically talks about this. We can um, have it debayer the images right off the top right after calibration and cosmetic correction. It'll debayer the images and then it will align the images from there. That's the standard flow. Or we can create separate RGB images. This means we would be outputting a uh, monochrome. Now it'll already be debayered, but it'll be a monochrome red, green, and blue image that we subsequently can put together. And we can even save ourselves that last step of we can have it if we generate these three files, we can go ahead and have it output that RGB uh, frame for us. Um, so you can always just check the box if you like that idea, and it'll just go ahead and create that for you. So that's kind of fun as well. The reason why you might want it to go through this extra exercise of creating three separate images, three separate channels, is because some systems have aberrations, or it could be atmospheric dispersion, that causes fringing and slight offsets between the colors. And you'll notice the colors of your stars are wonky when you look at the, the edges of the stars. It might be one color on the left side of the frame and another color on the right side of the frame. So by aligning on each of the color channels, you'll be able to minimize that offset between the colors, which you couldn't have done if you had just worked on the combined RGB because then it's baked into each of the images. But by separating the channels, you can potentially align better. Now, if you don't have that kind of issue where all of the colors with your one-shot sensor and your system, your optical system and or atmosphere, it's all coming together fine, then the overhead of doing that, going that, breaking it up and then bringing it back together, that doesn't really do any, there's no big benefit in doing that. So in this data set, I don't recall there being that problem. <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to leave it as the combined RGB and it can do everything um, from there. That is it. That should set things up. What I can do here is create uh, perhaps a folder where I output the results to if I wanted to, just to keep it clean so I don't have to put it here where the raw data is. And I press the button. Now we should look at the diagnostics and make sure that there are no problems. So it's, oh, it says there is a problem. So this is interesting. I had forgotten about this. Let's see what the problem is. Problem is the flat field frames have an invalid file name and those characters will be replaced with dashes in the filter name. That's fine with me. So it has just this Bayer matrix thing that it's complaining about and it's gonna fix it for us. Well, that's actually very nice to do. The same thing is true here for the light frame. So that's fine with me. Go ahead, replace, um, replace away. Other than that, that's basically a warning. So we can go okay and subsequently run the, uh, the execution of WBPP. I'm not going to do it here. I already have that data done, but we have set it up with some extra commentary about how to go about doing it for this kind of data set. So I hope you enjoyed seeing the setup of this um, one-shot color camera kind of normal sensor that can take advantage of a bias frame with a couple of extra comments along the way.